Hey everyone, I'm Matt Jones. Today is Monday, April 18th, and currently we have some signs of a potential recession upcoming. Those include that the Bank of America has predicted we are just about to have some recession shock. Deutsche Bank has said that we're going to have a recession by the end of 2023. I've heard that the yield curve is inverting, and which is a sign. And then also there's Alan Greenspan, who says that the men's underwear index, which is that uh, you know when men have to save money by not spending on extra things like underwear, that's a sign of an upcoming recession as well. So I don't have the ability to predict the future, but I can say that there are some things that you as an investor can do to prepare for a potential uh, recession. And so today is going to be a classic episode with Todd Dexterheimer and John Stiles talking about those things that you can do. So let's get to it. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexterheimer. Now, let's get to it. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of Hump Day Hustle, the show where we focus on business and real estate as our core pillars of wealth creation. My name is John Stiles with Bridge Realty, and I'm excited for another great episode. Today, we're going to be talking about how to prepare for a recession, because we're always kind of wondering, are we at that point where we're going to be expecting one here? So uh, with that, here's our host, Todd Dexheimer. Todd, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastic, John. Yeah, the topic, um, well, first of all, I found it on Bigger Pockets, uh, written by our friend Jay Scott. Um, and so we're going to be basing a lot of the conversation on his articles. So shout out to Jay Scott. He was uh, uh, a guest just a few episodes ago. So listen to his episode. He's always got a lot of good information and just good insights. So, But recession is like the word you hear all the time. People are always asking when it is, and they've been asking that for a long time now, but it, it's just elevated as we continue into, you know, more and more times of good prosperity. We're wondering, okay, when's the end in sight? I think that's human nature to think, okay, when are the bad times coming now that we got these good times, when are the bad times coming? Yep. Yep. Sometimes even on a personal level, things have gone really well. And I'm like, well, this is great, but when's it going to end? The sun's going to have to set sometime, right? Yeah. So, so. yeah. Well, I think most of us are programmed to be, you know, be negative. And uh, sometimes we have to re try to program ourselves to try to be positive, but um, we also are realistic too, and that's important to be as well, is realizing eventually there's going to be a recession. So that's what we want to talk about. We don't know when it's going to be exactly. Um, and if anybody is listening does know when it's going to be uh, with 100% clarity, uh, let me know. I'd love to find that out. <laughs> yeah, just put that in the comments below. And we'll yeah. <laughs> go from there. <laughs> right, right. Um, so anyway, John, anything, uh, new on your end that you want to, uh, talk about quick? Um, nothing too new. I mean, we are headed into the spring market, so I'm working with a few new clients and, um, yeah, it's an interesting market. Uh, lots of multiple offer situations still going on. So we're st still experiencing a very, you know, strong sellers market right here. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Are you seeing a difference between last year and this year? Are you seeing that there's a pretty good strength still? What do you What are you seeing in the in the single family realm? Because I don't really do too much in that phase. Yeah, um, like I said, we. I mean, just the other day, I was offering on a property with for our buyer, and uh, there was nine other offers. We had offered. I, I think it was like $10,000 over asking price and, you know, lost out. Uh, I don't know what the winning bid was, but um, yeah, I think there's still plenty of people that need a place to live and uh, they need to move whether or not, you know, uh, regardless of where the economy is at, they just need to move for whatever else their reasoning is. So, um, so far there's, there's not enough inventory available and we're, we're looking hopefully that as the weather continues to warm up, thankfully it is much warmer than a month ago, 
but we're, we're hoping that, that uh, some people start to move so we can have some houses available. Yeah. So are you seeing that most people that are buying, are they first time home buyers coming from a rental or are they move up buyers just exchanging houses? What do you, what are you seeing as far as the, the buyer pool? Um, you know, I don't personally have the whole buyer pool here, but, uh, <laughs> but for me, I mean, we've had some move up buyers and then, you know, I work a lot with investors too. So they're yeah. looking for things like, um, properties that would work for home health care. Um, is that a big thing right now? That home health care thing? I've got somebody that's subleasing one of my properties doing the home health care. Yeah. A lot of people doing that. I think so. I think that, you know, that's a great way. That's a great business model that, uh, there's a lot of money in it. And, um, there was yeah. a, I know there was a guru that came into town, um, maybe six, eight months ago that, or maybe it's been longer now, but that taught basically that model. I'm wondering if that's a, uh, direct correlation with this home healthcare, uh, kind of run up that you're seeing right now. I mean, my main client with that is he's been in it for a while, so he didn't go to the seminar and suddenly decide to do it. But okay, um, and there's a lot of competition with that. There's only so many houses that will work. Mm -hmm. You know, you need preferably you need a single level house with three or four bedrooms, and yeah. um, so there's you know there's not so many of those houses available. So yeah, yeah, there's challenges in that as well. Yeah, interesting business model. I've looked a little bit into it, but I haven't really gone, uh, you know, too much. But it, it you can actually make houses, like you said, there's limited houses, but you can actually make a house work for a higher price than a regular rental because your your you know gross income is much higher as well. So sometimes you can. I don't want to say overpay. You still have to have fundamentals uh, working for you, but you can pay higher prices uh, than somebody else that's just going to do market rate uh, rentals. So, yep. uh, well, cool. So for me, I, I'm in the middle of a capital raise still. It's going well. It's, um, you know, that w with that, it's, it really important just to be reaching out to the investors and, and continue to, to make sure everybody knows what the investment's all about. Everybody's got different questions and some people don't reach out to you. So reaching out to them is important. Uh, every time I've done a capital raise, I reach several people um, by, by doing the phone call uh, that are very interested, but hadn't, reached out to me yet and they've got some questions or, or things. So it's important to always be, you know, reaching out to your investor list and, and trying to find out what kind of questions they have and where they're at with it. And a lot of people are happy you call because they wanted to, they, they do want to commit some money or they do want to get involved, but they've been busy or whatever reason it is. Um, and it's also just good to connect with people too. I mean, that, that's your, if you've got your investor list, it's good to connect with them. It's good to make sure that uh, they know you're still around and that you know what they're doing too. I, I, I talked with several investors um, yesterday that, you know, had different various projects going on and, and it was just good to talk about that and what they're doing. Um, some of them, weren't interested in investing because they're buying properties themselves. Some of them are, uh, you know, are doing both. So it was just kind of, uh, it's always kind of fun to, it's a good excuse to talk with your investor list. Um, so that's, that's nice. And so anyways, we did the whole, you know, webinar, um, we put all the offering docs on a Dropbox so everybody could look at everything. Uh, we're still working on putting the PPM, final PPM together. Uh, but that way, all the investors can look at everything. They can hopefully get their answers, uh, their questions answered through, you know, we do a Q&A and all that kind of stuff. And, and so hopefully they can answer most of their questions there. And then, a, you know, a phone call or email can answer the rest of their, their questions. So uh, definitely a stressful time uh, here while you're doing the money raise. Um, but, 
uh, obviously an extremely important thing because we can't close unless we raise the money. Um, and then the real work begins, you know, then we, then it's about implementing the business plan. So just when you think you maybe have some relief because you've now raised your capital, uh, then the, the actual real push, the real work begins. So I'll have about a two day, uh, two days off and then I'll start to then, you know, worry about, uh, how we're going to get this thing off the ground and started quickly. Hmm. So. Yeah, I can imagine Maybe that two hours off <laughs> with, uh, with in, your investors, you know, some of them are going to have this money burning a hole in their pocket and they can't, can't wait to find a place to put it. But others, mm -hmm. you know, they've got their priorities with family work and whatever else. So you, you really have to be active in reaching out to them and make sure that they realize your investment is a good option for them. So. Yeah. And some of them just quite frankly, just it's, it's timing's not right. Um, you know, I've had some investors, uh, I had an investor that, um, reached out to me via email, uh, this morning and just, uh, apologize and unfortunately it's not going to work for me. And, and there's some personal issues in his life and good, very good reasons, um, that he can't invest. And that's great or not great, unfortunate, but I mean, it's nice to know and you have to understand where people are at. Everybody's at a different position in their life at the time you're doing the offering. And just because they're not going to invest at this offering doesn't mean they're not future investors. <clears throat> so um, it's just how it is. I mean, everybody's got different things going on in their life and, you know, different, different uh, money events and all kinds of personal events and stuff like that. So. Well, good. Talking about money, why don't we get into uh, yeah. what we do if there is, or to prepare for a potential downturn in the economy. Yeah. So. Well, first, John, I wanted to talk about when are recessions happening? When, when do you, when's our recession happening, John? When? I guess I have my phone on. So apologize about that. <laughs> when's our recession happening? Uh, I don't know. It's in the future. What? <laughs> it's not right now, right? We know it's not right now because it's not happening. Um, but it could be, you know, there's, there's some signs of volatility. Uh, however, those have been, it seems like mostly curbed. We are having signs of volatility, I would say, in the last, you know, maybe the third quarter and fourth quarter of 2018. Um, and it seems like most of those have been fairly kind of put to the back burner where we're not freaking out, but people were freaking out. Interest rates were going up. Uh, stock market was going down. Uh, reports weren't as rosy as what we wanted. And now it seems like it's kind of shifting towards more positive and, and the growth that maybe that was just a kind of just a blip. Um, and it seems like it's now going up. Interest rates have actually gone down. Stock market's back up. Um, things seem rosy again. So we don't know um, where exactly we're at. I know you and I were talking before the show, and there's it's all over the internet. Our friend Ray Dalio, um, who is a very well-known, uh, he, he wrote a book and he runs... Um, uh, what's this company called? I can't I think of it. Anyways, he runs a an equities company. They, they're they very well known company and have done very well in the markets. And he just said, basically, he's saying there's not a recession coming uh, anytime soon or, or right now. Um, so, you know, people are kind of pulling back their expectations and instead of 2019 being a recession, we might be into 2020 or 2021. Um, and we also, John, I, I look at countries like Australia and you and I talked about Australia before. Um, Australia is going on a, I think it's 28 year run right now where they haven't seen a recession. And so why can't the U S go on a 28 year run? What's stopping the US from being Australia and going on a 28 year run or even a 20 year run? I mean, we're, we're into what year 10 right now? 
and we're expecting this big recession to happen. So it doesn't necessarily have to happen just because historically it happens every, you know, eight to, to 12 years or something like that. Um, doesn't mean it has to happen. I mean, Australia is a perfect example of we could have a 28 year boom in the economy and they haven't busted yet, by the way. So they could still go another 10 years or more. Yeah. And, and I'm not familiar with Australia, but as you were mentioning earlier to me, uh, they've got a lot more uh, immigrants coming in to their uh, country as a percentage. Uh, I think you said 25% of 50% more. Okay. Than the so, US. so, you know, population growth is, is definitely a huge factor in, in mm -hmm. creates higher demand and where there's demand then supply typically hopefully will follow. So that's just one of many, many factors. Um, so, yeah, I mean, without getting, in, I think, you know, without getting into politics and without getting into economics too much, uh, you know, we as the everyday consumer or person investor, maybe you can just see what are the healthy habits that we can put into place regardless what can we control because a lot of those things like population growth we can't control I, i've done my part i've got four kids but <laughs> there's not much else i can do <laughs> yeah keep making babies right and that's if we want to continue to have a economy that's always booming we just make a bunch of babies and let a bunch of people from in, into our country and we're going to be good right we always we, the more people we have the more consumption we have, more money is being spent. That means the economy is going up. So when we look at the economy and how well it did kind of during that baby boomer uh, era, it did really well. It, it went up for a long time. And so, and that probably had a direct correlation was the amount of babies that were being born uh, does help the population. So um so john congratulations on four kids thanks for helping the economy out i'm sure everybody's happy for for that uh, aspect yeah you're welcome yeah but then now you got to start spending more money because <laughs> stop being so frugal would you hey the north star real estate conference is back it's may 2nd and 3rd and this year it's a bit different we're going to be hammering in on multifamily real estate and we're going to show you asset management, value add strategies, raising millions of dollars through syndication, and how to find those hidden gems in today's market that are just so tough to find. And one of the biggest things I'm excited to bring you is industry experts that you're gonna be able to put on your team so you can hit the ground running day one. So join us May 2nd and 3rd at the North Star Real Estate Conference. Look forward to seeing you there. Well, anyways, the point is we don't know when the next recession is happening, but we know eventually a recession will happen. So we want to make sure we're prepared for that. And we don't want to assume the sky is falling and assume it's going to start, uh, you know, the clouds are going to start tomorrow. Um, so we don't want to freak out about it, but we do want to be prepared about it. And I think no matter what time we are in the economy, good good, bad, or, or otherwise, we should be doing things to help prepare us. So um, a lot of this information, again, is from, from Jay Scott's article, but just good information. And then, you know, some of our own opinions as well. So you want to start us off with something you think uh, people can do? Yeah, well, the Jay's first point is hoard cash. And uh, so, I mean, that's, cash is, is what you need when you have, uh, debts that are due when you um, suddenly all the equity and it disappears in your property or maybe the you can't get tenants to pay what you used to be able to get them to pay um, you're gonna need some cash to take care of all those uh, you know liabilities yeah for sure in so many um Somebody posted on Bigger Pockets again uh, the other day and, and said something about uh, their friend that had all these properties in 2006 you know, six and, and they, they owned all these properties. They were making tons of cash flow and then the economy went out. They lost everything and they were freaking uh, her out about that. 
and she was just talking about strategies. And one of my uh, responses among many is, well, you know, likely the person didn't have much for cash reserves. You know, what was happening in 2006 and it's happening now too. And it scares me a little bit with investors now is that people were buying a pot property. They would do some re renovation to it or maybe no renovation, but they would get a hundred percent financing on it, get all their money back out. Uh, and that's okay to do. That's a great strategy, but you also have to make sure that your loan amount is at the right amount right? If we're putting a loan amount more than what we'd ever think about buying that property at, is that a really a good prudent thing? And then are we putting money aside for potential downfalls, a potential recession, or just as simple as, you know, we got a roof that uh, needs to be replaced. We got uh, flood damage from a freaky, uh, freaky spring that, you know, we never, we never experience. Um, all kinds of stuff happens that if we don't have money set aside, it's really hard to pay the bills and eventually that property is going to go away. So hoarding cash, as Jay says, uh, is important. Uh, having that cash, having those reserves is extremely important. And also having something on hand while a recession happens is a great thing too, because now we have opportunity to be able to buy things because we do have cash on hand. So it's not just about so I wouldn't just be crazy. I, I, I don't really like the term hoarding cash, <laughs> but I would make sure you have good reserves on your properties. In my opinion, it should be about eight month worth of uh, principal and interest reserves on your properties in order to make sure you can make it through any kind of uh, uh, downturn, a minimum of eight months. And then also have some reserves for you know capital improvements that you might have to do as well. Yep. And I think uh, this is important to think about because I don't know about you or, or me, but a lot of people are experiencing pay raises or they're experiencing higher rents, you know, so we've got more cash to work with, hopefully. Um, and the tendency or the temptation can be, well, got more cash, let's go spend it. Spend more. Uh, yeah. But if you can just, you know, still live on the same or still spend the same, um, mm -hmm. it's take advantage of that, put away that extra cash because there's going to be times where you're going to need it. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not spending all your money, making sure some of it's liquid, uh, putting some money into investments that are liquid. And a lot of people don't want to have a bunch of cash laying around. I get that. It doesn't make any money in the bank. I understand that, but there are some lower yielding um, options that you can have to make sure you're staying liquid. Uh, I think liquidity is just really important, especially the more assets you purchase, um, the more liquidity you should have. And sometimes it can be painful when you look at your bank account, and see a large number. I know that sounds weird, um, but, and you know, it's just not making any money, but it's important because if you don't have it, well, guess what? You're not gonna have anything eventually. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so the next point that we want to look at is opening credit lines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, now, now is a great time where banks are lending, equity is high in your, your home, and so get some home equity, get some, get some lines of credit to have available. And it doesn't mean you wanna take that money and use it. Don't, don't just take it and use it to, to buy your boat or four wheeler or you know cabin or anything like that. You never really have to use it right now, but it's good to have available because right now it's easy to get. So let it get that line of credit and let it sit. And that way when recession does happen, you have that credit line already open and you have that potential to use it. So um, my advice too is when you're using a credit line, be very careful um, and make sure that you understand that it's a, it's a line of credit and exactly what it is. The, the bank could call it due if they need to or want to. Um, so it needs to be something that's flexible. We don't want to use it as a, a 
necessarily a down payment on a property that you're never going to get back. Um, it needs to, you need to make sure you can make your payments on it. You need to make sure that you can be, you know, liquid with it too. Yeah. I mean, like you said, just don't go out and buy something that you don't need or that's just, you know, don't take your vacation on that credit. Um, but, but at the same time, you know, banks are more likely to lend to you when you don't need it. So if you wait till, you know, the market goes down and you're in a real bind and you need the money, if you go to your bank, they might not want to give it to you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It's always good to do when times are good, when the bank is wanting to lend and when everybody's just basically free with their money. It's always best to do. Again, you don't have to spend it right now, but having it available is, uh, I think, extremely valuable. And it also helps you qualify, you know, for loans. You can show it as proof of funds. Um, so it's, it's, it's a nice tool to have and to use uh, when you're buying real estate. Yep. I know my wife and I were just talking about something similar to this. I mean, we just got our property tax valuation notices for 2020 and we're like, wow, that's what they think it's worth. Uh, <laughs> but then we're like, Oh, we we've got a lot of money tied up in their equity. You know, should yeah. we pull this out? Is it wise to do? Um, like think of the things that we could do with that money, but, but we want to, you know, not stretch ourselves beyond what we should. Mm -hmm. Well, but, but if you're pulling a line of credit, I think the, the biggest downfall with the line of credit is your temptation to utilize it um, when on things you shouldn't utilize it on, use it on such as stuff that's not making you money. Um, you know, go taking a vacation, buying a boat. Oh, it just, you know, what I've got, you know, let, let's say you can get a line of credit for $80,000. Oh, it's just, it's just $3,000 and we can go on a nice vacation. It's not that big of a deal. Uh, it's only at, you know, two and a half percent interest. We can just pay that back. That's where you get in trouble. People get in trouble with these lines of credit. And all of a sudden now the line of credit was a terrible idea. So if you have discipline, lines of credits can be good. If you don't have discipline and just don't think about it, then, then don't do it. I think that's where people can get stuck is when they don't have the discipline, they take it for things that are personal instead of things that are instead of business. Yep. Okay. Well, so speaking of credit, one thing to look at is your credit score and what you can do to improve that. Yeah, for sure. Um, and obviously doing things the wrong way is going to, going to lower it. You know, a lot of people, found that out when the market crashed. A lot of people lost their credit score that went way down. So, um, you know, when times are good, you can have a low credit score and get away with it, right? You can have a 600, you know, low 600s, even mid 600 credit score and get some loans, potentially even lower than that. Um, but when times are not good, when, when the market is, is soft, banks are going to want to see your credit score, you know, in that 700 plus range. And so getting your credit score up right now and getting a, I would also work on getting your business credit score up as well as your personal. So your business and your personal, uh, those are really important. If you can get those up right now, when times are good uh, and you're diligent about it, when times are bad, you're going to have a lot better opportunity to get uh, loans than uh, somebody else that just didn't work on their credit score. Yep. So again, and as we hopefully have more cash to work with, you can be paying down any loans you've got, make sure you're making payments on time. You know, those are two key factors to have a better score. So. Yeah. Get rid of, yeah. Get rid of your debt, get rid of credit card payments, all that kind of stuff. You shouldn't have any of that. If, if you do work on getting rid of it right now, for sure. Okay. Well, then another thing to consider here is dumping risky assets. Property values, as we've talked about, are high. And so there's a lot of buyers looking for properties. And if you're not getting the returns on a property that you'd like to, or it's causing you too much headaches, or, you know, it's in a 
not that great a part of town that you know you'd prefer not to be in you know now's now's a great time to be selling call me yeah. i'll help you <laughs> yeah call john styles uh, with bridge realty um no but i think that's that's very true it rings true for me right now i'm selling off kind of my lowest uh investments some of my single family houses that haven't made as much money on a monthly basis as I'd like to see and are in areas that saw a really big downturn during the last recession. Those are the ones I'm selling off right now. I'm trying not to sell everything, but I do want to sell a few properties that I think are in my bottom, you know, 20%. Um, I'm, I'm still keeping the majority, but getting rid of the ones that when you look at the history of it, you go, yeah, on paper, this thing looks like it should make 300, 400 bucks a month. But in reality, it's probably making us, you know, 50 or a hundred bucks a month, or maybe not even that. So those are the ones that we're getting rid of just dumping those properties that, you know, if, if the rent drops 20% occupancy rate goes way down, then they will lose money every single month. And, and those are properties I just don't want to hang on to right now. So I might as well take advantage of great prices like we talked about earlier and get rid of those properties. Yeah. And when the market drops, those are going to be ones that would be hard to sell or at yeah. least sell at the price, you know, the value you'd like to get. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some neighborhoods, some markets just keep and retain their value. I've got properties that are near the private colleges and those just maintain value. You know, you might go, they might go down a little bit, but not much. People are, that's very high demand area, whether it's a recession or not. Those properties I want to keep, right? Because they make good cash flow and, and they're in good areas. But the properties that are, you know, maybe a little bit less cash flow and are areas that just see a lot more um, downturn, those are the ones I, I want to get rid of. And I don't have anything in like terrible areas, but still, um, you got to kind of just look at the whole scope of your portfolio. Yep. Okay, so another one is if you have any short-term debt, so this would be a lot to do with uh, commercial loans, multifamily loans. Um, and if it's coming close to the end of your term, you know, now is a great time to restructure that refinance, uh, make sure you get something locked in. That's gonna, you know, hold you out for a while. Yeah. I mean, you know, Let's just say the you've got a um, a loan right now that's coming due in the next year year and a half, um, and a recession does happen in that time. Wh what are your options? And you've got to kind of look at that. How are you leveraged? You know, if you're leveraged at forty percent or you know whatever something something like that, you're you're going to have a lot of options. But if you're leveraged fairly high. First of all, it might be good to sell it. The second of all, it might if you if you decide, well, I do want to keep this property, well then get new debt on it for as long of a term as possible. Call a lot of banks. The you know, for me, I I did um, some refinancing uh, about two years ago, I suppose now, and I refinanced quite a few properties, and I called around banks. And I found a bank that would, was willing to, and they was very, very hesitant, but I pushed for it. Um, they're willing to put 10 year fixed debt on my, you know, one to four family properties. And that's, that's fairly rare in the Twin Cities, at least most of them are five years. Um, I also pushed and found a, a few banks on some other uh, duplexes out of state that were willing to do seven years. So as long as we can possibly push that out, the better my 10 year stuff, that's going to be fantastic for 10 years. It's locked in at low interest rates. I don't have to worry about it. I'm paying down a good amount of principal um, restructuring it in, in 10 more years should be fairly easy. Uh, even if interest rates are quite a bit up, I'm going to have a lot of equity built on those properties because I'm paying down a lot of principal for the next 10 years. Yeah, that's great. I mean, you don't want to be over leveraged. And uh, so definitely take advantage of the lower rates now, even though, I mean, rates have been going up, but they've been, you know, 
they're really still low right now. They're so low. It's so ridiculous. And we might say, well, yeah, but uh, the, you know, my, my current loan is, is not due for, you know, six months or a year and, and it's at, you know, 4% and now I'm going to be paying 4.8%. It's like, well, you know what? It's still really low. You might want to consider taking those steps to get it done right now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's all. Okay. So the last one we wanted to cover here is don't chase losses. Yeah. So I think for me, I, I've seen this, um, and this has been my philosophy throughout when I was doing flipping. Um, and even on rentals, you can say the same thing. Uh, eventually, it's we've already talked about it, eventually it's time to sell. But what I've seen in flipping, and I bought, my, I bought a personal house uh, that my wife and I lived in and, and flipped while we were living in it. Um, this was several years ago. I think we bought it in 2013, I believe. Anyways, no, maybe it was even before that. Anyways, uh, the timing doesn't matter. But what happened is this guy bought this property in, in 2003, bought it, renovated it, took way too long to renovate it, took over a year, finally put it on the market. And I believe it was 2004, um, and put it on the market for too much money. So a, he did a terrible job rehabbing it. That's maybe besides the point, but he spent too much money on that. Uh, and then B, he put it on the market for too much money. He was trying to chase the market up. And as the market continued to raise, he would continue to raise his price. So he continually raised his price just over market, thinking that, you know, he wanted to get his losses, of course, out of it. He wanted to make money. I don't know exactly what his philosophy is. I never asked him. But um, eventually in 2006, as we all know, the market took a dive. And he had to start lowering his prices. Well, he was always behind the market on lowering his prices. He was never where the market was. Again, so he raised, he was always too high. He lowered, he was still too high uh, as the market went down. So he's chasing the market all the time, but never was catching it. Finally, in whatever year we bought it, 11, 12, 13, somewhere around there. I have to do the math. I think, so it would have been about 11. So finally in 2011, we bought the property for $100,000. He paid more than that in 2003 when he bought it, plus he put money into it. So I don't know exact amount of money he put into it, but I would imagine he was all in for at least $150,000 minimum, probably closer to $200,000. Plus he had the holding cost of all those years and he had a loan on the property. So he had that cost as well. So I would imagine the guy lost a lot of money but because he was chasing losses the whole time. So this is especially rings true for flippers, but it's all about the velocity of your money. How quickly can you get in, get out and be done? And if you're going to take a loss, just take it now. Don't think you're going to wait for the market to go up. Don't think the market's not going to go down as much as you think. Just get it priced right get it gone, get John Stiles as your realtor and he'll help you get the pricing right and get it sold. And that's the most important part is you just get rid of the properties that are problems. You don't chase markets. Don't think you're going to wait it out. It's just never going to work. Well, and when we're pro pricing properties to sell, uh, we have this conversation, you know, with every seller, like, do you want to price your property above the market and have just a narrow amount of people that might be interested? Or do you want to price it at or below the market and, and cast a wide net mm -hmm. and then potentially cause some competition and some, you know, scarcity and then what if, and then you know, suddenly have got multiple offers. So. Yeah. Fl flippers that get in trouble and, and real estate investors in general um, that get in trouble. This, this is the same as, as, rental property owners is people who think that they can, that they're giving away too much profit and, and they're worried about that. And they're, they're paranoid about that. That that's people that are getting in trouble. Give, give away a little profit. It, that to me, that's a better business decision than thinking you can squeeze every single last dollar out of it. Uh, greed is always going to get you into trouble where I would rather go, okay, Market comp says this thing should sell for 200,000. I'm going to list it for, 
you know, 195, we're going to sell it instead of going market says 200,000, but my house is really, really nice. I want to sell, I need to sell it for, you know, 210, 220. Um, and, and all of a sudden nobody buys it. Yep. Those are the ones sitting on the market for nine months or more and or six years. And people are wondering what's wrong with that house. Right. Might be nothing wrong with the house. It's just the price. Yep. Yep. Just the price. And you know what? Sometimes you got to lose money and, and that it is what it is. It's painful. You go, wow, I didn't go into this thinking I was going to lose money, but you know, sometimes you just got to lose a little bit instead of losing a lot in the end. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Well, big shout out to Jay Scott for writing this article. Go check it out on bigger pockets. Yeah. yeah. We'll put it in the, the show notes and um, that way people can link and click on it um, and read it if they want to. But uh, I think we've covered a lot of it. So, but he's got just a ton of information. Like I said, he was a guest on the show. And so check, check out what he's got going on anyway. Um, yeah. Very good. Well, we appreciate all of our listeners and viewers tuning in and joining us every single week. Um, if you are enjoying the show, you know, be sure to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, uh, go ahead and comment, let us know you're there. And um, yeah. Perfect, John. Right, you want to close us out then? Yeah, man. Uh, well, that I, I don't have really much to say. You've said it all. Uh, I think we've covered it. So, hey, have a good day. Make every day Saturday. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. But your rating and review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to venturedproperties.com, venturedproperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also, look, if you want some help in multifamily, you want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.